appropriation or defending the commons group. And here I want to give three examples and spend uh, uh, a little more time than I have on the other ones on this last one, national carbon rights, because it's relevant to an issue that has been part of the political debate here in the United States and I hope will again emerge as a part soon enough. Uh, the first example are battles for environmental justice. It's pretty well established now that in this country, and I think probably in other countries as well, though the research is uh, more thorough in the United States, that uh, pollution doesn't actually uh, fall on everybody equally. Uh, you know, they, Bob Marley once sang, when the rain fall, it don't fall on one man's house. Now, it falls on everybody. But in the case of pollution, it actually doesn't fall on everybody. It falls on some people a lot more than other people. And in particular, people of color and low-income communities tend to be disproportionately exposed to air pollution and water pollution in the United States. Um, those communities have been organizing for the last 20 years or so to try to defend their environments. It's called the environmental justice movement. And in a way, what they're doing is trying to appropriate control over their air, over their water, uh, in order to protect their own, uh, or to really make those assets their own, and to protect them. It's an example of converting an open access resource into something that's more similar to property, where people have rights to it and therefore can protect it. Uh, internationally, if we think about carbon rights, which are, of course, a huge issue now. Uh, as many of you know, there was just another not very successful conference on this issue in, in Durban in South Africa. Um, if you look at, uh, this is the world at night, uh, to my mind it's a picture that uh, is worth a thousand words in telling you who produces most of the world's uh, carbon emissions. Uh, the people who have electricity are, are, the, are the big ones. Um, Africa pleads uh, not guilty. And allocating rights for uh, the limited carbon absorptive capacities of the biosphere is a huge uh, political issue. And by defining and allocating such rights, we are in effect converting an open access resource into a form of property. And how that property will be distributed is a critical international issue. Uh, any of you interested in this, I recommend this is a, this is a very interesting publication that uh, comes up with a way to try to translate this principle, which is in the UN Framework Convention, which was ratified by the United States under the Bush 1 administration, as well as by virtually every other country in the world, and provides the framework for international climate negotiations. It sets out this principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective uh, capabilities, and this greenhouse development rights framework uh, is an effort to sort of translate that into a practical and workable way for allocating international carbon rights. I don't have time to go into the details, uh, but I recommend it. Um, lastly, I want to say a little bit about uh, carbon policy here in the United States. And the underlying question really is, you know, who owns our share, our country's share of the atmospheric carbon, uh, atmospheric uh, commons, the limited carbon absorptive capacity of, uh, of our uh, planet. Um, in order to curb carbon emissions, it seems to me we need a mix of policies. There's not a panacea here, folks. There's not one policy that's the only solution. I think we need a mix. We need policies that operate on the demand side that will gradually reduce people's demand for carbon at any given price. Investments in energy efficiency, renewables, mass transit are examples. We also need policies that operate on the supply side that raise the price of carbon and thereby diminish demand uh, in the short run. And this can take the form of cap and permit systems or it can take a, the form of carbon taxes, which in many respects are the same thing as I'll talk about. So what happens with demand side policies? This is for any economist in the audience. I realize not all of you are. I won't show you many of these things. But with demand side policies, you basically reduce demand and therefore reduce both the price and the quantity demanded. That happens when you invest in mass transit. People don't have as much demand for gasoline, for example. With supply side policies, you actually raise the price and reduce the quantity demanded. Uh, so it's a different set of policies. Uh, ultimately, those supply side policies help to induce those shifts in demand by inducing people to invest in energy efficiency, more fuel efficient cars, uh, insulation for their houses, renewables, etc. Um, why do we need a supply side policy as part of the mix? Partly because we need to act sooner rather than later and by raising the price we can get immediate impacts whereas investments in things like mass transit and, and energy efficiency typically will take uh, much longer. 
It's also partly because, as I mentioned, the incentives for those investments by individuals, by households, by firms, and indeed by local and state governments are driven in large part by price signals. We live in an economy in which prices matter. And so if you want to see those investments that will shift demand, you need to have prices that signal that this is a profitable thing to do. Um, furthermore, I think a good reason to have such policies is that if you uh, put a price on carbon emissions through a permit system or through a tax, it means that people actually have to pay to use the limited carbon absorptive capacity atmosphere. They're allowed to pollute, but that doesn't mean it should be free to pollute. And if people have to pay to pollute, as I hope you will already, some of you, jump to thinking about, a good question is who gets the money? And that depends on who owns the assets that are being created by such a policy. 